Welcome, dear listeners, to today's anniversary episode of Diplomacy, Your Questions, Our Answers. My name is Sophie Kokash. I'm a student of the Diploma Programme here at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, and it is my pleasure to moderate today's episode. One year ago today, this online programme was introduced at times of the pandemic. Um, no live events were possible anymore, so everything moved online, as well as the Diplomatic Academy's public programming. Since then, we have hosted 20 sessions on a variety of subjects. First of all, mostly focusing on the COVID pandemic and its consequences in many different fields of policy and diplomacy, but also science diplomacy and breaking news events such as the crisis in Myanmar and in Belarus. The silver lining of going virtual, however, is that we can reach so many more listeners all over the world. And we thank you very much for that. Thank you for joining us and thank you for staying with us during this program. The topic for today's 21st episode of Evolve is Evolving Diplomacy, and I am honored to welcome three distinguished panelists who will discuss this topic from a political and academic point of view. Allow me to introduce today's exceptional panelists. Our very own Director Ambassador, Dr. Emil Brix, has inaugurated this program a year ago and is of course with us today. His distinguished career in the Austrian diplomatic service culminated in his ambassadorships to the United Kingdom and to the Russian Federation. His academic work as a historian includes numerous articles and books on Austrian and European history of the 19th and 20th century. Next, we are joined by Professor Markus Kornprobst, who holds the chair in international relations at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. He previously taught at University College London and Magdalen College at Oxford University. His research appears in leading journals and he's the author of seminal publications such as Irredentism in European Public Politics, published by Cambridge University Press. He also always works on a variety of subjects as research projects, for example, international crises, uh, the governance of nuclear weapons, building peace, and the rhetorics in international theory. Last, but very much not least, today's guest, special guest panelist is Dr. Daniela Pizoyu. She's the senior research fellow at the Austrian Institute of International Affairs. Her fields of research are terrorism, radicalization, extremism, comparative regional security, as well as American and European foreign and security policy. She completed her PhD at the University of St. Andrews, and she's also an alumna of the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. Her thesis studied Islamic radicalization and is included, and, she, and included several field works in Austria, Germany, and other countries of Central Europe. Her research is also extensively published in various journals, and she's the author of editor and editor of various publications focusing on radicalization. Her recent monograph, Terrorism, Theories of Terrorism, an Introduction, was published very recently. Before our panelists give their opening statements, there is also something that I would like to ask of you, our dear listeners. Please, you're warmly invited to ask your questions. To do that, just answer, uh, just comment on Facebook, and I will read out your questions after the opening statements. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to give our first word to Ambassador Briggs for your opening statements. Thank you very much, Sophie, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, when we started thinking about this meeting, we, we thought about the title, uh, and evolving diplomacy seemed to us uh, being a compromise uh, uh, between saying that uh, diplomacy is totally new and there is nothing new under the sun. And, and I think it's, it's a good example of, of where we are at the moment, because when we talk about diplomacy, we have to say, first of all, uh, that the basics, uh, the uh, objectives of diplomacy are not really changing. Uh, it is all about, and I can be very clear cut about this, it's all about power and how in the relation between peoples and groups of people, power relations are coordinated and maybe even, even solved. Uh, and the way this is done is through communication. That's very general. 
power relations we know, maybe uh, even in, in personal affairs we know what it means, but in, in, the, in, the, in the level of, of uh, the relations between states, this gets a, a new quality because the quality is that we have to look for something which nowadays we call common goods. So what are the common goods? Uh, for diplomats, the common goods are things like dealing with climate change, dealing with security issues, uh, dealing with the cyberspace nowadays, uh, dealing with outer space issues. So the, the number of common goods has been increasing tremendously. Uh, and this is certainly due, due to simply what we, we like to call globalization, that the communication nowadays, as with Zoom now, uh, is instantaneously and it can be done from anywhere in the world, wherever you have an Apple or a Samsung or whatever, whatever you use uh, for this sort of communication. Uh, so there is a difference in the speed of communication, uh, the possibility of communication, but the objectives uh, of coordinating power relations, uh, and I'm now even a bit more precise, coordinating power relations between, uh, beyond the national level do not change. Beyond the national level means that in the history of diplomacy, especially after uh, the Middle Ages with the Westphalian peace, then the Congress of Vienna, then the, uh, the, then the League of Nations and the United Nations systems, uh, uh, it is mainly about coordinating between the national levels. Uh, we all know this is no longer uh, absolutely true, and I think Daniela will talk about security issues where this plays a, an important role, that it's not only national actors. So we know that the actors are changing dramatically sometimes, and we know that the tools and the methods change. And I think that's where it's interesting, uh, was interesting to talk about. Uh, it's uh, that the number of actors and the importance of actors depends very much on the given, uh, given situation. Uh, and um, on the one hand, we see a return of national actors. Just think about the vaccine diplomacy where suddenly the, the, the state, the nation state, is the, the savior of last resort uh, for its citizens to get the vaccine, the right vaccination, to get the vaccination on time, and so on, because the health system is organized around the globe, mainly in the, on a national, national level. Uh, um, and uh, also the, the question of how to deal with climate change um, has seen a return of this idea of, of the nations being the main actors for, uh, for diplomacy. Uh, the, the tools, my second point, are also certainly uh, very much changing depending on the possibilities of communication mainly. And that means uh, everything that we talk about digital life in the future means that the tools for a diplomat nowadays are more on social media than on, on reading the Neue Zürcher Zeitung every morning. Uh, and this is a continuous process, but it is a surprise to many that the tools for diplomacy uh, have changed uh, so fast. Uh, and that uh, I think certainly, certainly, um, uh, being present on Facebook is more important for an Austrian diplomat now than, than, than reading all these newspapers that we used to read. Uh, and so the tools uh, that we have are on, in the digital uh, world and sometimes uh, we feel that diplomacy is only reacting to what's going on in this technological world. And there is a, is a bit of a problem that diplomacy should be much more proactive in, in dealing with these issues uh, like uh, artificial intelligence. What does it mean to use means of artificial intelligence in diplomacy? Uh, and what is the consequence of the use of, 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 of artificial intelligence in global affairs for diplomacy. So there's a lot of things that change. And also the methods of diplomacy are constantly changing now nowadays because some, we, let's go back a little bit to the 20th century. Um, in the 20th century, the idea was that finally the solution uh, to solving the problem of common goods for diplomats was creating multilateral institutions. First of all, after the First World War, without sanctions, 
then diplomacy realized it didn't really work. And then with 1945 and the UN system and the very complicated uh, system, which we have nowadays, that uh, if you have a, a combination of a rules-based multilateral order and the possibility of sanctions, some more strict, some less strict, then you have the best system that you can have to think about and find solutions uh, for the common goods which are growing everywhere and, and as we at least already said health is a common good and, and climate is a common good and security is a common good and you mention it and the common goods are growing uh, all the time sometimes we even say i don't know the, the right to to travel is a common good that we should uh, coordinate in a multilateral uh, way but there's one problem for my initial statement, that, and this problem is the system does not work. This system that diplomats are so proud of, uh, that was established in the 20th century, does not correspond uh, to what we see on the global scale now. It doesn't correspond to a not very balanced international system that we are in. It doesn't correspond to the power changes. It doesn't correspond to the fact that we have a, a big power politics uh, where we are not sure whether we are still in the American age or already in the Chinese age, uh, whether the Russians are really uh, only a minor power. Uh, we, do, we don't know what the role of the European Union and Europe is in, in, this, in this power play. Uh, so the answer that, that uh, is given in, 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 in international affairs in political uh, points is a return to identity politics, a much more political use of, of history uh, and what you might call realpolitik. Uh, and again, uh, this uh, sounds very different from what we had in earlier times, but even when you look into uh, the famous book by, by Kissinger, for instance, about diplomacy, you find already in the introduction that he says, um, um, diplomacy is about he speaks about uh, America mainly, is about the national interest that you follow, but it's also about the common good. So the, the common good that you, that, you, that you have to achieve. So that's where we are, an instable world order, which demands that we find in diplomacy ways uh, that we learn throughout the history of the diplomatic practice, which was built for a stable system. That's the idea of the United Nations, a stable system. So don't, don't do anything. Just think about the idea, don't change any borders. That's what we talked about in the Balkans. But we are always changing borders. Uh, and so diplomacy can, can, can say that's not the right way forward. But if in a real politic uh, environment, as we live in, uh, diplomacy has to evolve and to find ways to be proactive also, also in this field. Uh, so I think I should stop here because, uh, because uh, uh, I said, on the one hand, uh, there is nothing new, but on the other hand, there's a lot new, uh, and it's a challenge uh, for diplomacy. And I'm not sure whether we are already, uh, first of all, aware of these changes, and secondly, ready to, to integrate it in, uh, into our system, which tries to coordinate power relations beyond the national level, uh, and looks for a, uh, let's say, for a just and stable world order. Thank you very much, Ambassador Briggs, for that opening statement. If I may now give the word to Professor Markus Kornprobst for his take on our topic today, Evolving Diplomacy. Sophie, thank you very much. Um, evolving Diplomacy. Um, evolving usually has something to do with change, and uh, there can be all kinds of different changes. Uh, some happen quite slowly, and others a little bit more quickly. And, and this is basically how I'm going to structure my talk. So I'm going to give a quick overview of the big trends in which diplomacy has evolved since the Second World War. Uh, then I'm going to fast forward to the here and now, um, looking at diplomatic relations and the ups and downs of diplomatic relations amongst different diplomatic actors. And then in the third step, I'm going to put these two together. Uh, and my argument is that there's going to be a big myth, there's a big mismatch. So uh, on the one hand, uh, we have these uh, diplomatic relations configured in our day in quite antagonistic ways. And on the other hand, we have all kinds of demands uh, um, that stem from these large evolutionary processes 
um, more and more issue areas of diplomacy has to get involved in taking actually care of the common good in many, many of these issue areas to use um, language, uh, the common good has been mentioned by Emil Brix beforehand. Um, so, so much very quickly about uh, where I'm gonna go with this. So the big trends. So evolution bit large, basically, uh, what has happened to diplomacy uh, since the end of the Second World War? There are obviously lots of things one could say now, uh, but there are probably two tendencies that stand out. Uh, the one is a multiplication of issue areas, and the other one is a multiplication of diplomatic actors. Um, issue areas. Uh, if you think about the Congress of Vienna, for instance, obviously a long time ago, uh, then that was primarily about security matters and redrawing boundaries and everything. And there was a little bit about economics in there. If you think about diplomacy in our days, then most diplomats being posted abroad somewhere, uh, for them, economics is really the most important thing. So they are supposed to take care of the economic interests of their country. Um, but that's obviously not all there is to it. So uh, diplomacy gets involved in all kinds of issue areas that uh, previously were not thought about having anything to do with the international. Uh, the environment, for instance, yeah, is something that by now is quite clear to us that when it comes to climate issues, for instance, that, that these things have to be discussed on the diplomatic stage. Uh, but that is something that prior to the 1970s was, to put it mildly, much, much less pronounced. If we think about uh, global health issues, so this, this, uh, this notion that, uh, that public health is actually something that should be taken care of, amongst other things, among states and non-state actors, global public health. And that too is actually, that is fairly new. And one could go on now about these issue areas forever. Yeah? So development was something that had to be added uh, at the end of decolonization. Uh, migration is something that had to be added. Uh, science and technology probably would also be one of those fields and many, many, many more. Um, now, um, one can obviously ask the question, if you are a diplomat, um, are you actually well versed in all of those different issues? It's probably going to be very difficult. So uh, yes, as a diplomat, for the most part, you're a generalist. Um, but let's say if you have to look at uh, intricacies of human to human transmission of a virus um, from uh, then, then this is actually something that you as a diplomat is going to be very difficult for you to judge that. So you need experts. Uh, experts are definitely non-state actors uh, that are to be reckoned with. And to stay with my example of, of global health uh, and if one looks at international uh, treaties, international health regulations, for instance, then, uh, then the role of experts appears actually to be very strong. Um, there are all kinds of other actors on the diplomatic stage, celebrity diplomats, for instance, some of them are called, yeah, that's the Angelina Jolie's, for instance, uh, of this world, who to some extent can also make a difference if one thinks about Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals. They probably um, made an impact <clears throat> and so on. So these are, I think, really, if one looks now uh, um, at diplomacy over the long durée, then multiplication of actors and multiplication of issue areas, those are uh, two things that are actually uh, fairly new and they stand out. Um, none of those developments have happened simply by choice, of course, uh, but by demand. Um, so uh, if you have the problem of uh, epidemics, if you have the problem of pandemics, um, then, then there is a certain pressure that you deal with these uh, on an international stage, because the whole point about an epidemic obviously is that it spreads across borders. It doesn't necessarily care about these bureaucratic units, uh, but it spreads. And, and, uh, and at times it spreads globally and then you have a pandemic. Um, now, looking at this other kind of change, the more short-lived one, um, it's actually very normal that diplomatic relations experience the ups and downs. So if I would look at the Cold War, then uh, the typical Cold War history is one of detente on the one hand, and then another one on crises and exacerbation uh, of tensions. So these ups and downs are actually something that are fairly normal. 
Um, but these ups and downs obviously have happened in the last three decades or so here very much as well. And um, if we juxtapose now just for the sake of the argument, making the argument clear, say the 1990s and in our days, uh, then there's probably quite a difference. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that diplomacy really should take care of is restraint. So yes, uh, states quarrel about all sorts of things, um, but they should refrain from using force uh, in pursuing uh, what they want. This obviously amongst other things what the United Nations is about. If we compare that, uh, then the 1990s was yeah, very much the dreams about a new world order. Uh, it was about a collective security measure in the early 1990s, the Gulf War, um, and so on. If we fast forward, um, then we have a bit of a different picture. Yeah? So all in all, one has to say that restraint still holds quite well, um, at least amongst uh, when it comes to co direct confrontations between states. Less so in terms of internal warfare, less so in terms of wars by proxy, but in terms of interstate wars, uh, it holds quite well. Uh, but obviously we've had a couple of, of, uh, of incidences. Uh, so if one thinks about Russia and the Ukraine, annexation uh, of the Crimean Peninsula, then that is obviously something that is not, uh, cannot be reconciled with, with uh, restraint. So that is, a, that, is a, that, is a, that, is, that is quite a difference. Um, if we if we move on with that discussion, contrasting the 1990s and the, and the now, then compromise probably is another one. So compromise is meeting in the middle, and uh, if you want to achieve anything in diplomacy, you have to meet in the middle all the time, and that can be very painful, by the way, yeah, because meeting in the middle means, amongst other things, that you are convinced of something, or perhaps you are convinced of a certain interest that you that you have to pursue. And now you have to compromise. So you have to track back a little bit of that. Um, if one looks at the 1990s, then it worked actually quite well. So as a result, uh, all kinds of subfield of diplomacy were flourishing. Uh, the human rights field, for instance, clearly was flourishing. Um, from the human rights field, then you got impulses actually that went uh, sort of a positive impact to all kinds of other fields, arms control, for instance. Uh, so uh, banning landmines, cluster munition, uh, lately then as a latecomer, uh, nuclear weapons is something that has to do with the expansion of the, of the human rights field. And using the human rights field almost as something like a lens through which to look at international affairs. Yeah? So uh, in terms of the, the security of the individual, uh, the protection of the individual as opposed to national security. So it's actually quite a, quite a step. If we wanted to look at that now in terms of uh, how compromises work or do not work, uh, then uh, the picture is pretty bad, actually. Yeah. Um, another example there from the global health field. Uh, so uh, in 1995, uh, debate started about uh, upgrading and fundamentally changing, revising the international health regulations. So to be able to take care of uh, global epidemics in the future. That's a debate and that lasted for something like 10 years and then SARS-CoV-1 started. Yeah, so which usually in the literature is just referred to as SARS. Um, and after that, and, and the, 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 the repercussions, obviously, and in terms of if you look at the numbers, uh, there's no comparison to what we're experiencing now. Uh, but at the time, that was sufficient as something like a cognitive punch. And, uh, and, and diplomats actually sat together and, they, and they, they revised these international health regulations, giving actually quite a, a bit of authority to experts, so away from states to experts, quite remarkable. And it is, ultimate, it is uh, after all, a legally binding instrument. Um, <clears throat> if we look at it in our days, uh, there have been no debates about redoing the international health regulations in the last 10 years. And in terms of a cognitive punch, uh, so the only really considerable piece that you're gonna find there is I think a week ago, there was a publication um, in several newspapers, a call by 26 heads of state, uh, plus uh, the, the, the director general of the World Health Organization to work towards a pandemic treaty. Yeah, so, um, 
basically means yes, so that, that some states want to move ahead to, to, to learn lessons uh, from SARS-CoV-2, so from the COVID crisis. Um, but it's it's a it's a slow process and it's and it's a very partial process. Yeah, so 26 states is not like 196 states. 196 states the number of states who ratified the revised international health regulations. And um, and then finally, there's something like working towards uh, a common goal. So the more kind of free flowing communication. I and my researchers sometimes refer to that as polylog, or we can refer to it as a dialogue. And uh, that sometimes happens as well. So you try to find uh, solutions to common problems and you really try to make sense of them together. Uh, that is something that in diplomacy from time to time happens as well. Um, but I think if I would compare that now again, the 1990s and, the 20, and, and 2020, then again, we are very far away from that. Yeah? Um, think of a very simple issue, for instance. So where uh, does SARS-CoV-2 come from? Um, then, uh, then the World Health Organization uh, tried to identify the source of the virus, and then, uh, then the delegation was allowed to get into China at first, and, and then there were all kinds of uh, pieces of evidence that this, uh, that this uh, group of experts who were not, was not allowed to look at. Um, and then, uh, then a report in Nature actually put it very well, uh, saying a lot of uh, stones have not been turned. So, so that uh, quite inclusive, inconclusive evidence because there's very little cooperation there. Yeah. And by the way, I don't want to uh, I don't want to single out now one country, say say China, um, in the global health field. If I stay within that, uh, the cooperation uh, of states in general with the World Health Organization has not been uh, forthcoming in, in, in many ways. Now, if you put this together, then I think we have a real mismatch, yeah? So we have on the one hand, we have these big evolutionary patterns, uh, diplomacy getting involved in more and more issue areas, uh, allowing more and more, having to allow more and more actors onto the diplomatic stage. And on the other hand, we have the situation right now where restraint all in all still works quite well, but compromise doesn't, and this working out common solutions doesn't work either. Um, and that's obviously a severe problem. And, uh, and I think the global pandemic shows it very clearly that you would really need solutions to common problems. So you need actually global governance, uh, but in current circumstances, you obviously don't get it. And uh, then one can ask now the question about what can you do about it? So what can one do about it? Um, and it strikes me that it's very, very important for middle powers, smaller powers to step up. Uh, because in the current situation, uh, if we wait for say, Russia, the United States and China uh, to take care of fixing some of those problems that I've just sketched, I, 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 I have difficulties believing that it's going to work. Um, and, uh, and while power, obviously, in diplomacy is very, very important, power has different facets. And, and one of those facets has something to do with knowledge and with expertise and with new ideas. Um, and I think that this is something that we need. Uh, so I think that, that, uh, that, that if we want to do our part in moving beyond some of the problems that we, that we have right now, we actually have to infuse new ideas onto the diplomatic stage. That is, is, it's clear that it's very difficult. Um, and it's very clear that, it's, uh, that it will not be possible to sideline great power politics. Um, but at the same time, I think if one looks at, at issues that are very pressing and are very important at the moment, and, uh, and the COVID crisis comes to mind immediately and strike and, and, and strengthening the, the, the global health regime comes to mind immediately. I think it's if there, there are certain questions uh, on, on, on the table that with the necessary expertise, perhaps one can move a little bit forward. It will always be, will always be very difficult though. Thank you very much, Professor Kornprobst for your academic statement or from your point of view from international relations. And now I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Daniela Pizoyu with her background in security. I'm very curious about your take on today's topic. 
Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's very nice to be almost home again in the Diplomatic Academy. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a uh, concrete example, actually a kind of a case study. And I think it illustrates very well uh, many of the points that were already mentioned, such as, for example, the issue of big power politics, or rather, I guess, medium power politics in this case, identity politics, but also how the readiness to compromise has decreased. So, um, yeah, my case study is basically at this intersection between diplomacy and terrorism. As you might have noticed, terrorism is my, my, my main area, but also extremism and other things. Um, I think the case is actually still quite current. This is a news piece that I saw today where it says that the French government is urging citizens to leave Pakistan. So there is obviously um, a, uh, still a conflict going on between uh, these two countries. There's um, a number of protests in Pakistan, mainly related to other issues, um, but there's obviously also the issue of France and the, and the profit caricatures, which still seem to uh, influence the relationships between these two countries. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is basically, um, first of all, a little bit of a background of how jihadi terrorism has um, changed in Europe recently. Uh, then talk about the crises as such and the reactions to them. And you will see that there was the, there is a rather um, large difference between the reaction in 2005, 2006 and the reactions later on in particular 2020. Um, how this has then again effect, uh, had an effect on terrorism, Islamism, and then why do I think that this uh, difference has occurred? And I'm sure that the other panelists might have some ideas or even perhaps counter arguments. Um, so just um, to give you a, a short background, um, so jihadi terrorism in Europe has um, evolved recently in a number of ways, such as, for example, we had initially a very centralized, large scale kind of attacks. This evolved and later to decentralized medium scale attacks, such as the one on Charlie Hebdo at the time. But now what we have um, quite a lot is autonomous, small scale, basically individuals. And this is also uh, a little bit evolving towards rather extremism and terrorism as such in the sense of, in some cases, we don't really see the political motivation. And these cases tend to, to, um, to be similar more to the cases of school shooters, for example. What we also have at the same time is a growth of the Islamist Salafi movement in Europe. And this is very much different to the way in which, for example, other terrorist organizations evolved in the past. So first you had the movement and then you had a terrorist cell developing out of it, the so-called underground. Now, so in, in this case, it's a little bit different. First, you had the initial attack, 2004, 2005, and then there's a Salafi movement that is continuously increasing. And according to the coordinator uh, of the EU in, in terrorism issues, this is the main threat um, at the moment still. Um, in terms of counterterrorism policy, initially, because the initial uh, types of terrorism were very much domestic, um, it was seen as a matter of internal security, and it still is. So if you look at the uh, structures within the European Union, the main people who talk about it are ministers of the interior. Um, and of course, also the, the, the justice area is very much involved in this. Uh, and this is very much different to the USA, for example. It always saw or majorly saw terrorism as a matter of external affairs, reason for which, for example, they also use the military very, very intensely in this, in this policy area. Now, with the globalization of jihad, um, you cannot talk about terrorism as within, as being within the, the country anymore, obviously. Uh, but there's, all, there's um, a, a number of other actors that um, are very much uh, involved um, in this issue nowadays. Of course, the ones that I uh, uh, listed here. Um, but um, what countries do and what countries say at the diplomatic level is also very much relevant. So this is basically the background. I'm going to talk now. I'm going to lead you a little bit uh, through these two crises, um, just to see um, in an empirical way how, how the differences basically emerge over time. So we have the initial caricature crisis. And don't worry, I'm not going to show the caricatures um, at all. <laughs> um, so um, the initial crisis was in Denmark, where, where this newspaper published a number of caricatures about the prophet. Um, and that was basically a, a time when jihadi terrorism was just emerging in the, in the EU. And people were trying to understand why this is happening. And this is, that, that was a way of, uh, of the newspaper actually to show that terrorism is not Islam. That was their initial motivation, in fact. But they were perceived as being very um, offensive, of course. Um, 
And there was one which was uh, the most controversial one. Um, and the state reaction to it um, was not necessarily great, but um, also not so bad. <laughs> uh, if you see it here, perhaps it looks a little bit not so great, but still. So the state reaction initially of Denmark was to say, we do not receive uh, the delegation of ambassadors who came and um, wanted to, to, to have a talk about it. Interestingly, in Denmark until 2017, there was a blasphemy law, which was actually um, you know, forbidding this, this kind of um, actions. Um, so this to give an example of what the ambassadors wanted to say. So they, they came and they actually came with this um, um, intention of compromise. They said like, you know, you, we do understand what, what, you know, what your framework is, framework, you know, uh, freedom of expression is very important. We want to talk about it. Yeah, I basically just want to, you know, you to tell you to tell the rest of the people that, you know, um, we don't want to uh, demean Islam. Yeah, so they were coming with, with actually rather positive um, intentions. Um, again, uh, this is uh, an example from a Turkish ambassador um, who says, um, you know, we want to enter into a dialogue. Um, I wanted to also include this one because I think it's an important argument and it continues to be um, to this day. And um, the fact that, of course, there is freedom of expression uh, and there is, on the other hand, at the, at the other end, the, you know, the blasphemy laws. For example, in Pakistan, you can be killed or you can be executed, you know, based on, on this law. Um, but there's another um, kind of underlying issue, which is the relationship between the West and, and colonies. There's all this post-colonial discourse. Uh, because people say, even my students actually, <laughs> at the university said like, you know, the question is also, who are we talking about? So do we have a, somebody in a position of power showing something offensive um, about somebody who is not in a position of power? Is it like an abuse of power uh, between these two actors in this situation? Um, are we basically perpetrating this, this image of the other, of the inferior, uh, this orientalist discourse um, through, through these kind of things that we sell as freedom of speech. So this is one of the arguments. It was there, still is now. Um, later on, the newspaper apologized. Actually, they said they did not want to uh, offend uh, Muslims. And then the prime minister eventually also had a more balanced, I suppose, take on the thing saying like, you know, we do not want to demonize uh, groups of people based on their religion or ethnic background. Uh, and this basically changed. <laughs> so, of course, 2006, Charlie Hebdo republishes the Danish cartoons. Um, not so much happens. There is an arson attack, 2011. I should probably mention that one of the Danish um, caricaturists um, was threatened and was actually almost attacked by somebody. Uh, but there were, in a sense, no, no deaths out of, out of this issue. Um, what happens with the Charlie Hebdo um, case is that um, they continued to um, uh, disseminate these cartoons and produce their own, um, and two of them are particularly pornographic. Um, and one of them was actually um, shown by um, Samuel Paty at the time in France. Um, so the reaction to this was um, clearly heavier. Um, and you can see here how things precipitated with the terrorist attack 2015 and then um, the attack on Samuel Paty. And um, it basically became a diplomatic incident uh, with Turkey as well, uh, in which case also Charlie Hebdo had a role to play with this caricature, which I will not very much insist on. Um, but there's a, a bigger thing to it as well. Um, due to other, other kind of discourses that were present in France, the whole thing was all of a sudden perceived as friends being against Islam. Yeah, so you see this polarization where we're not talk, we don't even talk about freedom of expression anymore, but it's really like us versus them. Yeah, so th th these are they and they are against us, the Islam. Um, and yeah, this is just another, just to, to show that there are all sorts of dissenting um, opinions as to you know, what, what things should be shown to, um, to uh, children and, um, and whatnot. And again, this uh, argument of vulnerable population was used again. Um, but just to go back to the main issue. So yes, there was a caricatures, but there was a whole discourse that happened before the, the attack on Samuel Paty. So, and these things really got mixed up, yeah? Um, people, of course, did not say terrorist attacks are great. Um, so the critique outside France related more to what Macron said before. 
So at the beginning of October, he had this whole speech about uh, separatism, where he said that Islam is a religion which is in crisis all over the world today. Reaction by Erdogan is a clear provocation. Um, after the attacks, the government projected the cartoons on government buildings, we know that. So there emerged a whole diplomatic crisis out of the merger of these two incidents. And you can see here who, who protested again. Erdogan came back again saying that Macron had lost his mind. Um, and what you had then on the other side of, of uh, in the terrorism area, of course, several copycats in France copying uh, the assassin of Pati. And uh, it seems also to have been an inspiration for the Vienna attack. So a whole mess, right? Um, now, what can we conclude between these two examples? We see that there is, the, there is an increase of offensiveness um, of, um, of the, what is being said, what is being produced, but also of terrorist reactions. There is an instrumentalization by Islamist right-wing extremists, but there's also a decrease of readiness to engage the other at the diplomatic level to work together to see how can we solve this. Um, and, this and this is my, my finishing line. Um, what do I think are the reasons for this? Well, of course, there are different levels. Um, some commentators refer to the um, um, competition between France and Turkey in Africa. Um, there is a competition for influence there, apparently, and these things have been instrumentalized uh, to that extent. There is an instrumentalization of Islam and of laicity in foreign policy. Here we have, again, the identity politics and how that basically reflects in diplomacy as well. Um, what we definitely also have is the rise of the far right in domestic politics in, in Europe, a mainstreaming of the far right, um, and a big role it plays in elections. So we know that there's French elections coming up, um, and Marine Le Pen is a very strong competitor for Macron. Um, and similar to other countries, um, there was a number of topics that he has adopted, which used to be basically in this far right area. Um, what we also have is a growth of Islamist movements in Europe, but also an increased visibility of conservative religion. Um, and in many cases, politicians seems to, seem to have a difficulty distinguishing which is which. Yeah, I mean, what is an expression of religiosity? What is fundamentalism? What is, yeah? So for example, the, the debate of the headscarf, just to give you an example. And um, finally, polarization, uh, where people, and I'm not sure if it's also an effect of the COVID pandemic, I think it is, but whereas people are not ready to talk about things anymore, but just to also on social media, basically just throw in their, their position uh, on, the, on the side, on the other side, and the question is always, or only on which side are you? But the sides never talk to each other. Uh, and that's just, I mean, this is something that I think is very worrisome. This is a person in France who is not in the party of Marie Le Pen, but you can see here how you, you, the Great Reset is a conspiracy theory uh, propagated by the identitarians and others um, and conspiracy theorists. And basically it's, 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 an, it's an appeal to do something to prevent France from disappearing. He talks about the war of races. So you see how, uh, how polarized, how extreme the discourse has become in mainstream politics. Um, and with this, I'm done. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pizoyu. Thank you for your presentation. Now, before I open the floor for responses by our other panelists, I would also like to remind our audience that you can post your questions in the comment section on Facebook. And after the responses from our panelists, I will read them out to our panelists for your questions to be answered. Thank you. Any responses? If I may start. Cool. Uh, I, I, I fully agree with both my colleagues that uh, the space for compromise decreased over the last years. I'm not sure uh, whether it's 30 years or uh, whether it has to do with uh, um, the, the onslaught of, of Islam, Islamist terrorism. Uh, but what I feel is that it has to do uh, with some sort of a change in our ideological setting worldwide. So with the end of, of the competition between capitalism and communism, there was this famous idea of the end of history. And with the end of history, it's, it somehow looked as if we can also 
do away with the public role of religions or the religions uh, in the public field or in the social field. Uh, and France is a good example for this, with a long tradition of laicity. Austria is, is, is a different matter here, but I think nowadays differences are less strict because Austria is also uh, quite strongly using uh, the idea of Islamism in pol for political reasons, but this is a different issue. We're not discussing uh, domestic politics in Austria. So the, the, the space for compromise decreases or decreased also because there is this uh, lack of clear ideological divisions uh, and, and the, the, the idea that we are closing to the end of history and that it's only a question of the best technological solutions or uh, whatever you see uh, to come to, a, uh, uh, to the happy future that you're looking for. Uh, and that is, to a certain extent, what I feel also uh, diplomacy uh, has supported. Uh, I would say to a certain extent, unwillingly. The idea that it's finally, as, as Professor Kwantrup said, that it's possible because we are not having topics that we invent ourselves, but we are not by choice, but we respond as diplomats to what's going on in the world, that this may be also, maybe this was also not helpful for looking at constraints, that there are a lot of historical con constraints, that there are a lot of ideological remnants, there are a lot of, let's call it in this case, religious issues, social issues, but that it's, that it's possible uh, uh, to create the best of all worlds by diplomatic means without using force. Uh, and now we're in a situation where we realize that is not the case. Uh, so how should we respond to this? And uh, uh, just give, let me give one example uh, where it, is, it did not work, really didn't work in the Austrian case. That's the UN migration pact where the idea was for quite a long period of consultations that it's possible uh, to find common ground on how to deal with migration and even do it on the UN uh, level. Uh, and Austria was for a long time among those who promoted it strongly on the level of civil servants and the level of diplomats. But at the end, politics in a country like Austria, but also in other countries decided no. We, we, we don't see that there is a, a, a compromise um, that can be achieved uh, on the global level uh, for whatever the reasons, maybe domestic politics, maybe ideological issues, um, that's up for grabs. Uh, and what we realized in this case, for instance, that the role of diplomats is very much a difficult one if politics decides otherwise. It was simply not possible for Austrian diplomats uh, to make it happen that Austria joins the migration pact. Uh, and, and this is just one example of, of, of where I have the feeling that we still have a lot of illusions that it's possible to solve the conflicts that have been developing in the last 10, 20 years by only by non-coercive diplomatic means uh, hopefully using global fora, global arenas. Uh, as I see it, but this is maybe for Professor Kornbrops to, to, to comment, that uh, it will be not enough that smaller powers speak out for global multi multilateral relations. Cl smaller powers always speak out for this because it's the only chance, because otherwise, in big power politics, they are just recipients uh, of the what's left on the table by the big powers. So that's clear. But when we are not in a position, when we don't find diplomatic means to convince the big powers that to achieve objectives, the, the common good, then we will not be successful. Uh, and we see this problem also in the field of, 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 of nuclear disarmament, for instance. Uh, where it's, I'm very happy that we have uh, 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 progress in this in, in this arena that we now uh, ratified uh, various documents in this, 
but we have not achieved that any of the nuclear powers is ready to do this. And my question to Markus Korbop is, uh, should we continue uh, to build up illusions about this? Is this the best way forward for diplomats? May I answer straight away, Sophie? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> no. Um, that's a very good question. I mean, with the with the uh, with the illusions. Yeah. Um, I mean, the hope of the the humanitarian initiative with the, with the, with the nuclear weapons was to to generate some momentum, and so basically seeing that uh, that there is a complete cul de sac. Uh, in terms of nuclear disarmament um, at uh, the conference on disarmament in Geneva anyway. And uh, so, so that is that is that is being uh, plays no role whatsoever because there are these diplomatic positioning games about procedure because of that nothing can happen. And uh, and then uh, the, the review conferences of the NPT are just extremely repetitive. So it's basically always the same issues. So Article 6, disarmament, good faith and everything, and nothing happens. And uh, it was an attempt to, to change uh, things around there. And, and I, um, I have to say, I really admired uh, uh, Austrian diplomacy there. Um, as well as as well as uh, Swiss and and originally Norwegian, Chilean, Mexico, South Africa, whoever was involved, that it was basically the, the core states, um, because what they also the International Committee of the Red Cross and 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 the International Campaign to land, Ban Landmines, because they changed the frame of reference, and by changing the the frame of reference, so from uh, a, a national security argument to human security argument. Um, they, they, they generated the biggest movement within this nuclear arms field ever before. So, so, uh, so usually there's, there's a non-aligned non movement together or the, 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 the Western powers or the, the, the nuclear powers of NATO members and everything. Um, but there, but there it was to some extent it was cross cutting and, uh, and it was, it was actually a large, large number of states by far the overwhelming majority of states that, that joined that. And, um, and it was quite interesting to see, say, in Vienna, uh, at the, at the, when, the, when the humanitarian pledge was made at the, at the, at the conference, the last one uh, before, the, before the treaty negotiation started, that the nuclear weapon states, they, uh, they had no argument against it. So, um, so the conference was organized, I remember that very well. So there was a two-day conference. and. The idea was the first day is uh, is experts, civil society, uh, and witnesses actually. So there was a harrowing account of a, of a victim uh, of the Hiroshima uh, attack. It was actually the first speaker, and then after that speaker, and the American delegate stood up immediately and and, and gave his prefabricated statement, and uh, so that was that was basically and that was completely out of sync. Was felt like that by all others. So it was basically the let's let's call it a traditional diplomacy that didn't fit into that into that uh, into this environment. Um, and um, but you but uh, but you're absolutely right that that if one if one if one now says okay so is everything said and done so yes there's a nuclear ban treaty um, but there's not a single nuclear weapon state in it. That is that is true. Um, my my hope would be that this kind of momentum continues. So so that it's more difficult now to 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 sideline this 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 view uh, this, this humanitarian perspective on nuclear weapons, say in NPT review conferences. Yeah. So so uh, so so in past conferences uh, it was basically shouted down. Uh, uh, by nuclear weapon states, and they are very much in, uh, acting in concert with one another there. And uh, so there are no great power tensions there whatsoever. And, um, and, and, and so I think that has become a little more, more difficult. And if one, if one so is an, an optimistic view there is that, that over a longer period of time, perhaps, 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 uh, that will make an impact on these, uh, on these debates within the NPT. Uh, and on never-ending debates on on, uh, on nuclear disarmament, perhaps uh, a peace conference in the Middle East, and and, and all of that. But yes, I mean, there's those are slim hopes. Uh, um, there's a slim hopes, but I think it's a very good example 
uh, for what smaller uh, for what smaller states can accomplish uh, on the international uh, scene if they if they if they if they play their cards very well. And I think I think there's uh, within the humanitarian initiative they they played their cards quite well. There's a I want to say one more one more thing, but uh, very quickly because I, I talked too much already about uh, so this link between foreign policy uh, to me, between domestic politics and and diplomacy. Yes, I mean that that link is very strong, and uh, and um, and uh, so 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 I recently uh, published published a book that compares crisis management patterns uh, France, Germany, and United Kingdom, and it's really very very pronounced if you compare uh, Mitterrand on the one hand and Chirac on the other, uh, if you compare Kohl on the one hand, Schröder on the other, if you compare Major on the one hand and Blair on the other. Um, then the former always, uh, so the predecessor, uh, they were basically thinking in terms of primacy of diplomacy, primacy of foreign policy. So, so for Mitterrand, foreign affairs were very, very, very important, and he would do basically what he was convinced to do, very much in the French interest, very much in terms of raison d'état. Um, and uh, but but the big domestic repercussions of that, whether there was not big agreement, yes or no, whether the media rebelled against him, yes or no, he really didn't care. Um, and this obviously has changed quite a bit. And uh, so it's changed quite a bit already with, uh, with, the, with the successes that I, that, I, that I mentioned. And that's probably all over. Uh, it does in, in many, many uh, states of the world by now. So you basically have a primacy of, uh, of domestic politics. And, uh, and so it's very, very important to do well in, in public opinion polls and everything. And that obviously makes it more difficult to compromise. Yeah? And even the term compromise has assumed such a negative connotation, I find. Yeah? So there's a connotation that, yes, I compromise on my own beliefs if I, if I meet in the middle with, with someone. And that's, that's very difficult because uh, that's, that's really what diplomacy is probably ultimately about, this, this, this meeting in the middle. Okay, just um, a couple of short points. So definitely agree on the domestic politics uh, issue and about um, the instrumentalization of various things, especially identity, religion. Um, but concerning external affairs, I think um, one thing that really worked well in the past was the OSCE, um, because it was an area where people did not necessarily accuse each other of things, but they first of all entering a dialogue and that's how the change could happen in the East. Um, it wasn't by, you know, accusing them of being this and that, but it's like, okay, well, you know, step by step. Um, what we have now, even in the OEC itself is, what, what researchers on that area talk about is how um, the project of spreading the Western norms um, is starting to fail. And you see the non-Western norms, um, also in Central Asia, for example, and other places uh, becoming stronger. So, um, and, and this is a shame because this is the way to go really. So if you are, for example, France or somebody else who thinks that, you know, my norms are actually better than, than others. And if you want to promote them, you know, there are ways to promote them. But if you call the other country names, it's not gonna happen, <laughs> yeah? So there are other ways which perhaps look weak, but are so much more effective. That's the one thing. The other thing is um, there is not enough preoccupation with security and terrorism, I think, in the EU External Action Service. So in particular, um, in the area of, of counterterrorism, the only thing they do is to make sure that when there is a, um, a contract with another country, there is a clause saying, and you will do these things in the area of, in, in the area of counterterrorism, or at least this area, or this subject is very important for you. Well, that's not enough, <laughs> yeah? Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's still a perception of saying terrorism is, is a police issue, a justice issue. No, it's a foreign affairs issue. It's very important. Um, me, who is working on, 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 this, on this topic, I can see the effects of foreign policy on terrorism. And they are often not that good. <laughs> so why not use foreign policy to have a positive effect? Because as you guys have said already, security is a common good. Uh, if terrorism is growing as it is now in Africa and, and Southeast Asia and other places, uh, it's going to affect us sooner or later. So it is definitely a matter of foreign policy. Um, and for some reason, it's not seen as such yet. And this has, has to change. 
and that's it from me. I can only agree because I was very often in contact with the uh, counterterrorism coordinator of the European Union in Brussels, and he complains all the time that uh, nobody is listening him, to him from the foreign affairs people, uh, and the, the member states do not want to share information. That, that's definitely a big problem with a phenomenon which is global, of course. All right. If the discussion amongst our panelists um, has ended now, then I would like to read out some questions from our audience. The first question is from Clara Vukedic. As a result of the pandemic, climate change and increasingly complex geopolitical constellations, strategic foresight is seeing a revival in policymaking and EU policymaking. The approach to strategic foresight can vary from method to application. However, the aim is to construct future-oriented policies that envision alternative scenarios in different fields. What role could diplomacy play in strategic foresight on national, EU, and global level? Who has an answer who would like to um, give comment on this question? I mean, I can, I can, I can, I can say a few, a few, a few cautionary words, perhaps. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so strategic foresight. That sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, and yes, I mean, that's what strategy actually ought to be. Yeah? So, so you ought to plan your moves ahead, very much thinking also what other players in the game are going to do next. It's a little bit like a chess game. Um, it's just that, that uh, strategic documents uh, and, 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 the, and the EU documents in particular, yeah, uh, they're very political in nature. Um, and uh, so uh, they sometimes are lowest key common denominators, uh, global strategy probably being one of them. And uh, so to what extent there can really be then this, this, this guidance, uh, that's, that's a, there's, a, there's a big question mark there. And um, um, if, one, if one looks at a, lit a literature on strategy, then, uh, then there's usually often a mentioning of uh, the United States, yeah? and the United States grand strategy. And uh, yes, I mean, they, they, they usually do have a grand strategy, which may sometimes be about foresight and sometimes not. Yeah? Probably the most famous one is containment. That was a, a, a grand strategy. Um, and, uh, and yes, I mean, any kind of actor can have one, yeah, um, so that it can, be, it can be a terrorist organization, um, so the, the kind that Daniela talked about. Um, they unfortunately have sometimes very good strategies, so, so uh, if you think about Al-Qaeda, for instance, at its very beginning. Um, and, um, and then you have, you have these, these joint actors uh, that, that sometimes have it really really hard actually to come up with these strategies. NATO is also one of those. Yeah? Um, uh, where it's not always easy for NATO to convert on a, on a, on a grand strategy to have uh, strategic uh, foresight. Yeah? Um, and it's, by the way, it's also one of those areas where, where expertise, experts and diplomats and foreign policy establishment obviously come together. So it is important uh, to have uh, to listen to experts, and and when it comes to these experts, uh, by the way, uh, also very important to listen to area specialists. We usually don't do that, uh, or politicians usually don't do that. So uh, so let's say counterterrorism, which we talked about beforehand. There's usually it's simply this this uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, yeah. And if you look at, uh, at North Africa, Libya in particular, if you look at the Horn of Africa, uh, Somalia in, in particular, um, then uh, as soon as some, 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 some faction uh, fashions itself as being uh, anti-terrorist or anti-Islamic, uh, then they usually reap the benefits uh, by the international community, sometimes uh, very easy for them actually. Um, and in that way, uh, things, things uh, at, at, at the place actually can get uh, much, much worse. So, so in short, uh, I'm all for strategic foresight, um, but I'm not sure where, it's, where that's it's always happening. Yeah. Well, if I 
which I also do, I'm very much uh, aware that the European Union does not have strategic foresight. And I am not the one to make uh, this statement alone. Uh, the, the very fact that Ursula von der Leyen, when she started her new commission, uh, spoke about the geopolitical commission was an attempt to say we need strategic foresight. We need actually, uh, which is what is necessary for foresight, to know first of all uh, where we are and uh, where we want to go to. So we need a narrative. So the idea of, uh, of, of, of the European Union uh, to create a narrative uh, which is different from the narrative that we had when we were uh, talking about enlargement and talking about the internal market and talking about the peace function and so on, um, uh, even the humanitarian function of the, the European Union, um, now to have a, a strategic foresight which puts the European Union on the map of one of the players between China and, 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 and the US uh, would need strategic foresight, which is so far not in the European Commission, nowhere. Uh, so there are small attempts uh, to go forward on, on, on this and the strategies have been mentioned, but the strategies that the EU has and the papers uh, on relations with China, or, or these, are, these are all uh, really minimal compromises between member states. Uh, and my fear is that uh, strategic uh, foresight will not come home to the European Union until there is a common narrative about what the role of the European Union in the coming global situation should be. And this will depend very much on what we already said about domestic politics uh, in the member states and, 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 uh, and how this how this can be changed. So you, you understand I'm very pessimistic uh, about the whole notion of geopolitical commission and talking about sovereign Europe and European autonomy, because it's, it's good to have the rhetoric, but there is nothing behind it. Um, I can also say something about it, I guess. Um, in, in this area of counterterrorism, it's definitely the case that one is very reactive. So one reacts to things and one tends to overreact to things, but there is no long-term strategy. Um, I'm not saying that that as such is always good. So if you look at the um, American example, they always have a national security strategy with this kind of um, foresight and also guided by certain principles and objectives, what they want to achieve in which area. This was not always a good idea or it wasn't necessarily appropriate, such as for example, the strategy preceding the war in Iraq where um, the hope was that we will democratize now one country and it will spill over to other countries. Uh, and of course, something else happened. And this was very much based on, on, the, on the democratic peace theory. Um, but um, it lacked a knowledge of, um, of the region. And this knowledge of the region continued to lack for a while. So I guess my point here is it's important to have a strategy but it's also very important to have the, the knowledge of the phenomenon of the region of the actors. You have the data, the evidence. Uh, and going back to the experts, um, it's, you know, uh, politics doesn't necessarily always um, like to listen to experts because sometimes they say something they don't like. Um, but in the long term, especially if it's a measure of strategy, this element is actually very important. And it's time for the next question by Philippe Goeres. He actually has several questions which are interconnected. So I'll read out his message. Thank you very much for these very interesting insights. I also have some questions which might be related to the previous question. The UN as a basis for multilateral treaties and peacemaking missions in the world has been much criticized in recent years for not being effective enough and neglecting essential progress in many aspects. So is the UN Security Council a product of the post-war era and out of date today? What role do non-state actors, keyword NGOs, but also the UN play today in addressing the challenges of our time? And is there a need for a new global institution that includes 193 states of the world? Very extensive question. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's basically a very simple question because 
no, the UN system is not up to the, the, to, to the causes at the moment, but we don't have a better system. And it will be not possible in the foreseeable future to create a, a better global system. Uh, so I would always support uh, reform processes within the UN system that concerns the Security Council, that concerns the uh, individual parts of the UN system, that concerns uh, uh, how processes are working within the system. Uh, so here I'm a moderate optimist that the pressure uh, is growing on this system uh, to improve. Yeah, that's maybe just, I see it very similarly. So in the, when was it in the mid 1990s, uh, when I was still a student, I was an intern at the German mission to the United Nations in New York. And the big thing at the time was the end reform. <laughs> and, um, and obviously, and, and especially with the Security Council, I mean, that was a question that was asked by Philippe. And uh, we all know, I mean, um, mildly put, not much has, has happened there. Um, there's no question that that, that causes uh, problems. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I mean, if one if one would uh, make an out counter um, counterfactually say, okay, so the UN doesn't exist, uh, that probably would be a real problem. Yeah, because the United Nations is an important forum uh, for for discussion. And there have been actually quite a few uh, important initiatives coming coming out of this discussions, also coming out from from the from the UN Secretariat actually. Um, and uh, so, so for the time being, obviously, there the, is a very imperfect institution. Uh, but I'm very 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 glad that we that we have it, uh, despite all of its uh, problems. So concerning the Security Council in particular, I mean, yeah, we all know that it's a big problem, especially the veto system. Um, and in the end, um, states end up doing what they want, also because there is not necessarily um, any punishment if you do it. So it's nice if you go there and you try to make your case like they did in 2003. But if nothing happens, then it's also OK. You can do it by yourself, right? Um, so that is definitely something that, that needs reform. What I can, however, say with regards to UN is that, um, and not the Security Council, but other organizations such, such as, for example, UNODC, um, they are very important in other kinds of programs. So not, not the hard security, so not things like military issues, um, but um, the other things that come before and after. So how do you prevent, in the first place, conflicts from emerging? Uh, and this includes addressing a number of issues, which can also be, for example, economic in nature, or the role of women in, in various countries, or the empowerment of certain groups of people. Uh, and what happens afterwards? So, for example, uh, they have they do very good work in terms of um, integrating, reintegrating society for more combatants um, or foreign fighters and things like this. So I think Whereas the UN can be perhaps disappointed in some areas, they're doing actually quite a lot of good work in others. So that's for me. Thank you. Our next question is more of a comment by Tanya River. She writes, uh, just a fuzzy idea to transform games into serious play that includes variety into conclusion all framed within a cosmopolitan global thought and scaled or translated into regional needs. That sounds very nice to me, but uh, uh, not very practical. Uh, sometimes I always, uh, 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 I would love to have such a formula, a big formula uh, to do a thing, uh, but in diplomacy, uh, you learn that the small steps are hopefully turning into big formulas uh, without any guarantees. So I would rather say it's more important to try to, to do these practical small steps because there is still always some space for compromise. And I actually am now contradicting what I said at the beginning that the, the compromise is getting smaller and smaller, but there is still some uh, space for compromise. Uh, and, and we do have the structures in, in diplomacy to work with these small spaces of compromise. Uh, and maybe to a certain extent in, in our uh, social media bubbles, 
it gets more difficult to make this hurt that there is this space of, of compromise still there. Uh, 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 and maybe this is one of the issues for diplomacy, uh, also to, to, to help be it terrorism, be it um, Islamism, be it uh, migration, uh, to, to get out of these bubbles. Yeah, so I think I think that um, there's always room for that's what I always tell my students. There's always room for ideal theory. Uh, so um, because sometimes these, these 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 big, sometimes really philosophical ideas, they have some kind of an impact in in in, in politics. So if you think about uh, early writers on, on something akin to democracy or republicanism that uh, probably would have been unthinkable for them that something like that actually at some stage really happened. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, of course, the, we're never gonna get exactly where this is ideal is. And, um, and, and I think the diplomacy amongst other things is a positioning game. So, so as a diplomat, yeah, you're supposed to take care of the, the, the national interests of your, of your, of your country. Um, at times, uh, you've got to understand, or at some times you have the instructions that, um, that that is a common interest that goes beyond the states, that may even be a global interest, yeah? So and if these interests coincide, then you obviously you can work with it. You will still have the positioning game there, yeah? So, 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 so state representatives, they do have a tendency that they try to make their country shine and and and, and to, to assert themselves vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis other countries. Um, and uh, and so this is something that I think is very much woven into uh, into diplomacy and you know, you're gonna get it out uh, very easily. So what I what my thought was on this was um, I think I think it's a good thought, uh, not mine, but the one that was just said. Um, I think we're in a situation now where we start to realize that there is no ideal model and especially that it doesn't work to try to push one on the others. Um, and there is resistance to this. Yeah, there is even resistance to the idea of democracy in some countries, um, some countries that used to be on the way to democracy until recently. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should give up. I think what is really needed is um, perhaps a bit more perception of and respect for difference. Uh, I think others need to be heard um, and there needs to be a, a space to allow these differences which are local or regional. And once this basis is ensured, then next steps can come. And I think there would be even more um, readiness to listen to these you know, good intentions that we have with these, with these others. Um, and to give you an example, I think, um, and talk about other kinds of actors, not just state actors, there is in Europe this um, radicalization awareness network. It reunites practitioners, also policymakers, also researchers. Um, but the idea is to come together um, and to try to see who is doing best in what area. Yeah. But there's also understanding that some things don't work everywhere. Uh, and this happens, they call it safe space. Yeah, so we meet here, it's a safe space, you can say what you're thinking, you're not going to be ostracized. Um, but there is, of course, a, a basis of, of minimal things and values that, that we agree upon. And I think these kinds of models, Mark, might work better than say, we have this great idea and the whole world needs to adopt it. Thank you very much. I would like to finish with a question of my own, if I may. So um, it has already come up in the discussion and in the presentations earlier, uh, the topic of vaccine diplomacy. And Professor Kwan, perhaps you have just mentioned that um, there is a positioning game going on amongst the states and especially the big players around the world. Uh, we've seen in the recent months that India started this game of vaccine diplomacy and very quickly Russia and China have jumped on the bandwagon. Um, this is also in the environment of growing uh, pressure to vaccinate populations around the world. We feel it very much here in Europe. How do you think will uh, this vaccine diplomacy and especially these quite aggressive efforts by uh, a number of countries change the diplomatic landscape uh, in a post-COVID world? 
Uh, will it help to establish uh, those countries, uh, especially India, um, as a more global and more important global player, even more than it is uh, already? And how might this uh, influence uh, this relationship between uh, the nations, especially uh, West and uh, the Asian uh, powers uh, in the future? There's, um, yeah, so vaccine, vaccine uh, diplomacy. Yeah. That is something actually that's, that's already quite old. Yeah? So that the term is new, it's a, it's, a, it's a neologism, I think one would say. Um, but the, the practice actually is quite old. And, uh, and it is very much about uh, raison d'etat. So um, if you, uh, just as a thought experiment, so, so, so think that there are no uh, nation states in the world and there are no nation state boundaries in the world and everything, or, uh, or you just look at it from a, from a purely epidemiological point of view. Yeah? If you look at it from a purely epidemiological point of view, then you need a global strategy to do something. Uh, about uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so that means that you need to have a global uh, vaccination strategy. Uh, you need that because otherwise you're gonna get all kinds of mutations uh, uh, around the globe and, 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 and you're gonna have massive, massive problems uh, with this kind sort of virus and the mutations of the virus for a long time to come, yeah? And, uh, and obviously, what we what we what we have now is we have uh, very much yes everything about the national interest. So vaccine diplomacy is a uh, trying to get as much uh, vaccine dosages for your own country as possible, and b for those countries you can who can export uh, vaccines, uh, they use that obviously for for geopolitical reasons. So if you um, what is this? Uh, according to an Amnesty International report, I don't know whether it was recently published, that four percent of all the vaccines thus far have gone into the global south. Yeah, four percent. Um, and uh, when it comes to those four percent, uh, say look at African countries, and you can pinpoint exactly say where the Chinese uh, vaccinations go. Those are countries that are considered to be important uh, for natural resources and, and everything by by China. Um, so it's uh, it's it's I think it is one of those one of those those issues where 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 um, with an enlightened self interest one would come up with a, with a with a global strategy even an enlightened national interest I think uh, but but like that is difficult to be fair now to diplomacy though we have to be fair to diplomacy uh, if you are a foreign minister and uh, you're going to stand up now in any country yeah. Uh, you're going to stand up now and say, oh, okay, so I want to have a global strategy. That means um, we're going to deliver <laughs> vaccinations to you, uh, my dear citizens, in, in, in a year or so from now. Then obviously that's, it won't wash. Yeah. Um, so, so to some extent, we are back at, uh, at, at domestic politics and, uh, and, and uh, things that you can do and things that you can't do. Yeah? To some extent, I think we're also back at the issue of a compromise. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that this global perspective, there would be something, something in Richelieu's term, the raison de système. And, uh, and, uh, and the national, the, 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 the nation focus one would be uh, a raison d'etat. And, um, and ideally one strikes a balance between the two, I think. Yeah? But I mean, so if one wanted to look at this on a spectrum now, we'd obviously, the vaccine diplomacy very far down on on the horizon. Yeah, no, I, I would like only to add that it is a classical competition situation, which you could apply to any other sort of whether the where the demand is bigger than the supply, uh, and diplomacy doesn't act differently from when you have such a demand supply situation in any other field. Uh, what makes it so special is that it has to do with life and death, because the, the vaccination promises life. Uh, and it is very clear that in a situation where uh, politicians are elected in their nation states, in their state, that they have to make sure that in this competition situation, they get the vaccination. So from the point of view of the importer of these of vaccinations, 
it's very clear that he or she says it has nothing to do with geopolitics. That's what the Austrian prime minister also said. It has nothing to do with geopolitics. From the point of view of the exporter, yes, it's, it's obvious that it's being used as a, as a geopolitical tool. Uh, and it's also obvious that it's used as an, as an exporting um, uh, uh, marketing uh, a trick. So they want to make money out of that. But my real point is, so this is not surprising, say, but my real point is, who is doing also vaccination diplomacy? What about these pharmaceutical companies? Are they doing vaccination diplomacy? Uh, how do they act? Who are their partners? Um, what does it mean that suddenly uh, Pfizer, BioNTech is not discussing with the member states of the European Union, but has to discuss things with the European Commission? Uh, was that, what does it mean that they make together with the US decisions about what is possible to export and what not? What does it mean that the UK can say, uh, um, it, as it was said, AstraZeneca is first of all for us, and then it can be exported only. Who makes the who, who, who calls the shots? Is it the pharmaceutical companies there, or is it the, is it the political leadership? So these are issues I think which are important, um, but not so much the general idea that we are in the middle of a of a competition for getting as much vaccination as possible. I think this is very much illustrative of the uh, bigger issues and the positionality of the EU in the world. So you could talk about this issue, but another issue, um, issues as well. And the question is, again, what is the role of the EU in the world? Is the EU allowed to have a role in the world? Um, how, to which extent is the EU more concerned with internal issues and internal fights, whereas the other powers of the world are dealing with, with the big phenomena at hand? And we can just see we can be for or against this so-called vaccine diplomacy, but I think it's also for, uh, especially showing us how handicapped the EU still is in terms of foreign policy because of all these infights between the member states. Thank you very much for your answers. Um, last but not least, we have received another question from an audience member. So I know that the time is already uh, quite late, but if you allow me, I would like to read this question. It's uh, from Veronika Wittmann, and she writes a fairly short question, short and sweet. Uh, diplomats across the world are an epistemic community. Can global awareness in training diplomats be a powerful tool to reach more global cooperation and understanding? <laughs> As director of the Vienna School of International Studies, I have to adamantly say yes. That's what it's all about, what we are doing, <laughs> trying to, to help create, to help young people to, to, to understand what's, what's going on and how important it is that, that, we, that we find common ground in diplomacy. There's nothing more to say from my side. Uh, for me, for my side, it's also very easy. I agree, exclamation mark. <laughs> um, I can say, as a former student of the DA, that the experience there was was amazing, not just in terms of the education as such, but the possibility of meeting people from different corners of the world. And it has helped so much these people to gain an understanding of the other. And I'm sure that you know, if, if there were clones of the Diplomatic Academy all over the world, or at least more of it, we would have this kind of level of understanding and readiness to compromise to talk. So yes, keep on doing what you're doing. And as a current student, I can just reiterate what Dr. Pisoyu has just said. It's an amazing experience here, even during COVID, even facing lockdowns after lockdowns after lockdowns. And uh, I very much hope that uh, Ambassador Brix's dream of the mission of this institution carries on long into the future as it has carried on since a very long time ago. So with this, uh, we would like to end today's episode of Diplomacy, Your Questions, Our Answers. Thank you very much to all our listeners for tuning in, for listening to the discussions, for posting your questions. Uh, please stay updated about our future events. They're updated on our Facebook page, but also on our website, which you can find in the Facebook profile. 
and stay in touch with us here at the Diplomatic Academy. I wish you a nice evening and goodbye.